But I don't care about the product. He was a fantastic salesman. Yeah. And libertarians are terrible salesmen. Ron Paul was a fantastic, or is a fantastic salesman, remains mm -hmm. a fantastic salesman. Is there anyone else you can name in the libertarian movement? I mean, not, you know, not to crap on anyone, but like, mm -hmm. we don't have those fantastic salesmen like Ron Paul. I mean, there's just, there's just no one I can think, maybe Dave Smith. I can think of some people, I can think of a few people that are good at selling the product, but we don't have enough. We don't have enough yeah. people uh, with that uh, Trumpian salesmanship. I mean, he's a businessman, right? So he was in business his whole life. He was all about, you know, he was a salesman his whole life. And yeah. some people would argue a con man his whole life. But <laughs> What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty, physical, and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, everybody, this is In Liberty and Health, episode 160-something. I'm somewhere up there near 170. Anyways, today I got Ezra Wyrick here with me today. I said that right. I asked him before the show. Sometimes I don't always do that. Anyways, how are you doing today, dude? Doing pretty well. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. A little bit chilly here in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, but uh, I that it's pretty good. Um, you're down in Tennessee, correct? That is correct. Okay, so whereabouts in Tennessee? I'm uh, west of Knoxville in the eastern Tennessee area, uh, right around uh, Lenore City, Oak Ridge, um, Knoxville, you know, right around that area. Yeah, okay, right on. Is it, uh, I'm guessing you guys are probably just like, oh man, it's like a little chilly here up here, like we're shoveling snow and shit. It's, no, it's, dude, chilly. it's, it's 44 here. It's 44. And in Tennessee, that's, uh, that's a problem. Oh my god, I could hang a hat on my stiffy if that was the worst of my fucking uh, works in the winter time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, now that we're talking about weather, you know, um, go ahead and give yourself a uh, introduction. Hello, um, my name is Ezra Wyrick. I am uh, the chief editor and executive director of Mises Magazine, uh, which is essentially an upcoming newsletter uh, from the Liberty Youth Coalition, which is an upcoming organization. A um, lot of lot of fantastic people there, and uh, this this magazine or slash newsletter. You know, we're not really sure. We don't know if we want to do a physical copy, right? So, I mean, we don't know if there's a market for that or if it would be better if we did a newsletter. So, I'm just you know keeping it vague for now. Um, but what we're doing is we're basically putting out a new uh, at this point digital publication to kind of counter some of the misdirection that we've seen from Reason.com. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm sure you're aware that they're not exactly what they used to be, you know, putting out some uh, some pretty crazy stuff. Um, so <clears throat> it just a little while back, um, Liberty Youth Coalition, uh, which has had several names. It used to be Liberty Lyceum. And uh, then it was Mies it was Mises Youth before that point. Uh, Emmanuel Ruiz. Uh, I believe I'm saying his name right. I'm not, you know, <laughs> um, but. He started uh, Mises Youth at the time uh, to counter misdirection at YAL, Young Americans for Liberty. I'm sure you're aware of that whole situation uh, with Reed Cooley, uh, with, uh, with Lauren Daughtery, and that whole situation there at YAL. So he started this organization from scratch. And then we started to see a lot of misdirection uh, coming, you know, drip, drip, drip process, not really all at once, but a lot of misdirection coming from reason. They started to sound more like the Cato Institute. Um, so uh, we think that's a problem here in the Liberty Movement. And uh, the Liberty Youth Coalition, which is what it is now, uh, but at the time, I believe it was Mises Youth, said, well, let's start our own you know, publication. And at first, uh, they thought about doing a physical copy. Uh, but then, you know, market for that, like I said before. Um, so a digital magazine which is essentially the same thing that Reason does, uh, you know, with articles, basically a newsletter. Um, so the, the object of that is to, you know, either replace Reason, which is a tall order, 
or to kind of, you know, give reason some competition uh, so as to kind of push them back toward the straight and narrow. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, that's that's really awesome stuff. Um, one thing that I've promoted a lot on this show is um, hopefully providing people good information in order to improve themselves. But um, kind of the, the, the nipping in the bud of that is – to um, make libertarians more culturally relevant people, because yes. um, <laughs> if you look at reason, you could see why libertarians aren't that culturally relevant, especially when you're justifying child drag shows um, yes. and finding ways to do mental gymnastics about how in a libertarian social order, you could have vaccine mandates. Um, ridiculous stuff like that is what makes the rest of us look like jokes, because um, quite frankly, most people who would ever consider becoming libertarians look at that and say, well, if they're just going to be, you know, um, half retarded, half off autistic Democrats, then I'll just go vote for Democrats because they can actually win. So um, that's really, really cool what you uh, got going on there. So um, what was um, was that kind of your inspiration, though, to kind of shift the culture over? I came on to uh, the uh, Liberty Youth Coalition uh, just about a month ago, actually. Okay, cool. Um, they, you know, they talked to me, uh, I have a little, a little bit of a following on Twitter. I don't want to say that I'm a celebrity, um, but, uh, I have had, uh, I guess, raise some eyebrows, some of my commentary and, uh, they wanted me to come on and lead the, the, you know, spearhead the, uh, the operation there with cool. the magazine slash newsletter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right on. That's awesome. Then, um, it, it's really cool to see younger people getting in and, uh, I, I hate to do the whole old man talking down thing, but it, it's fucking insane to me that I'm talking to someone who's literally 10 years younger than me. Um, I was born in 1994 and I saw you were born in 2004. To, to me, it just, it, it doesn't seem like it's that far apart, but 10 years is a hell of a long time. But um, so exactly. yeah, what, um, what kind of got you into libertarianism? Um, was it like a parent? Was there a certain moment? Um, for me, it was like my older brother who kind of you know, he was originally liberal and then he kind of like rubbed elbows with libertarians and eventually he said he was a libertarian. And then um, I always rejected the left and always felt a little bit more welcome on the political right side. And now I've kind of turned away from them too. But um, anyways, libertarianism has always kind of been my home politically. So um, kind of what has that looked like for you? Um, I, I guess it kind of got its start like Ron Paul 2012, which is what a lot of people say. Um, uh, most of your young libertarians will say that uh, Ron Paul 2012 is their, you know, their intro into the movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would say that for myself as well. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of interesting because some people become libertarians and then some people feel like they've always been. Libertarians. And me right. personally, I kind of feel like I've always been a libertarian. Uh, you know, a few years ago, maybe I leaned a little bit more on the conservative side, uh, you know, right leaning. Um, but, you know, I, I just kind of I feel like it was a natural progression. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always felt uh, kind of a resistance to like, um, well, a resistance to the state now, but just like in general, a resistance to like illegitimate authority for a very long time. And, you know, Ron Paul 2012 kind of said what a lot of, you know, especially the younger generation was thinking uh, in his 2012 campaign. He really voiced, uh, you know, opinions that most people in both the Republican and Democratic Party, like 99 percent, would never dare to say. He said stuff that was controversial. Uh, And uh, I liked that. Um, But I never really got into the libertarian movement until about 2016, maybe 2017. Uh, 2016, uh, which if you can believe it or not, I was 12 years old in 2016. Um, so that's that, that that's, that's kind of an interesting tidbit for you, just to show you how young I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but in 2016, when Donald Trump was elected, it was kind of an anti-establishmentarian uh, mindset, right? And uh, one of the positive aspects of the whole Trump administration and the Trump era is the anti-establishmentarian mindset that came from that uh, that time period, the Trump campaign. That is one positive aspect. And I feel like libertarians were uh, pretty pleased with that. The anti-establishmentarian aspect, not a lot of the things that Trump did, but obviously that part of it was good. Uh, and a lot of people, when Trump was elected, thought, oh, finally, here's a guy that's, you know, anti-establishment and, you know, saying stuff that a lot of people are thinking. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you know, bombs start dropping on Syria. Uh, you've got uh, the utter refusal uh, to pardon uh, Julian Assange. You've got 
uh, basically uh, the protectionist trade policy, which is extremely harmful. And uh, I would say that the most negative uh, aspect of the Trump administration has been the Republican Party and in general, the political rights uh, push toward protectionist trade policy. Uh, that's probably the most negative aspect of the Trump era. Uh, but anyway, whenever you have these, uh, you, had, you had the anti-establishmentarian mindset, that was good. That was something that people, uh, you know, Childs of the Ron Paul 2012 revolution kind of resonated with that. And a lot of people that supported Ron Paul in 2012 supported Trump in 2016 because it was the same kind of anti-establishmentarian mindset. But, you know, when the Trump administration started, when things started happening that we didn't agree with, we kind of, you know, said, just like everybody else, right? He's just like, he's just like any other politician. Um, so I think one thing that the Trump era taught us is no matter how, uh, you know, how, smooth, how much of a smooth talker a politician is, you cannot trust politicians. Politicians exist to disappoint. Um, and I feel like after the Trump administration, I kind of came back to my roots. I, Ron Paul, a libertarian, resistance to illegitimate authority. It, it was just kind of a natural progression for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I totally feel that. Um, For me, there were a couple of moments throughout the Trump administration because I was very, very pro-Trump at first. I was 22 when Trump was elected. So um, it was really interesting at first because he said a lot of the right stuff. And then mm -hmm. over time, I think one of <laughs> – this is going to sound pretty funny, but I think some of the moments for me were uh, – if you're familiar with Tommy Sotomayor, um, he had – um, had kind of railed against Trump for the bump stock ban and a whole bunch of people went after him calling him the n-word and this and that because he was railing against Trump for you know implementing gun control and I remember hearing uh, Ben Shapiro <laughs> say oh I'm not a fan of his spending and I looked into that and I'm like oh holy crap he spent like a drunken sailor and then um, also I you know just anybody with any kind of brain about economics knows that as you mentioned earlier protectionist trade policies actually hurt people much more than they help um, his tariffs in particular actually cost the American the American consumers or it hit Americans paid for 94% of those tariffs and China paid for 6%. And we only got 3% of our yes. overall steel from China. So um just just that whole deal really kind of disillusioned me from the this rendition of the populist right movement. While there were still some good things, um, I was largely disaffected with um kind of Trump as a whole after yeah. that. And it seems like you're kind of in the same vein. Yeah, economic populism is terrible, but I mean, I would just say that populism uh, uh, as a political strategy, I feel like that's that is definitely a way that libertarians can use to kind of become, like you said, more culturally relevant and maybe eventually start to, whether running in one party or another, uh, gain some political offices and maybe a little bit of political sway. Uh, I feel like populism is absolutely a viable political strategy for libertarians but economic populism is a different thing entirely right right and it definitely should be noted what trump did and that is to basically tell people that hey i don't hate you and i'm here to kind of be your savior but um if anything people should have learned after 2020 that you have to be the hero in your own story i say that all the time but yes. i feel like it's a more and more relevant term or you know kind of phrase because especially now in the biden administration you see this very very hard pining for a republican yeah. hero but no I one no one is coming to say you mm -hmm. as an individual are responsible uh for to uh form your own destiny Right. And, and that's really the most empowering message is that you are available or you have the capability to do that yourself. It's not like somebody else can come in and save um, save you from what's going to happen. It should be upon you to kind of you know bring yourself up out of the ashes, metaphorically speaking. So um, I've had this yes. thought and I haven't really got to bounce it off of anybody yet. So um, you'll be uh, the little guinea pig in this experiment. But um, I know people uh, – there's this one goofy dude in Georgia and he did good in the debates. But um, if you're familiar with who Chase Oliver is, um, he ran for – what was it? Senate in Georgia. And I remember his um, bio used to have pronouns and he said politics isn't binary – um, neither is gender or something like that. And it was something stupid. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, okay, well, in the United States currently, it is a binary political system. It is. But let's let's take a step back. Are all the problems that we're trying to solve as libertarians political? I don't think all of them are. And I no. think you can use a political vehicle to change those things. So um, I know that's a pretty abstract idea, but I kind of wanted to see what you thought about it. 
All right, everybody, we're going to take a little break from the show real quick to tell you about the show's sponsors. I am now working with the great Stephen Fox to bring you Fox and Sons coffee. As you can see, I got two bags right here, or for those listening, I was holding two bags. Um, it is organically roasted up in Michigan. If you're a caffeine addict, much like myself, um, then head over to foxandsonscoffee.com to get yourself some of their fantastic coffee. They got a light roast, which I'm holding in my hand. Um, they have the Electric Boogaloo Blend, which is fantastic as well. I just had it this morning, and if you're like me, you like dark roast coffee, which kicks you right in the freaking face first thing in the morning. Um, they have that for you as well. So head over to foxandsonscoffee.com. Use code Kyle, K-Y-L-E, to get yourself a little discount. Let them know that I sent you, and um, get yourself caffeinated, get jacked and tan, and do what you got to do. All right, guys, back to the podcast. Thanks. I don't think all the problems that libertarians try to solve are political. Uh, certainly political means are the best way to change things unless you just, you know, want to be like, um, uh, let's see, what, what do people call themselves, like uh, collapsitarians or is it collapsifarians? I always get that mixed up. It's like people that just want to watch the world burn. Like mm -hmm. they're just going to, they're going to get in their cabin in the woods. They're going to stockpile weapons and food and they're going to wait for the collapse of society. Right. Um, <laughs> personally, I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that all the problems are political. I think some of them are cultural. Obviously, a lot of them are economic. But you could make the argument that uh, economics is political. Um, but some of the problems are definitely cultural. So, no, I don't think all of the problems are political. Right. And I think this is something that it's hard for sometimes people to swallow that, um, you know, the progressives have had the march to the institutions and changed culture from there. But um, kind of bring it yes. back to economics, something that's always been really interesting to me that I've thought a lot about recently is how much economics impacts um, kind of our day to day lives and even our preferences. Um, when it comes to, you know, just how we behave, where when you have a low interest rate environment, because it's so easy to get credit and because money is so cheap, um, that's going to overall affect Easy your money. consumption. Mm -hmm. Right. It affects your consumption. So um, I, I think economics can be dry and boring. But the thing is, is that it really does drive a lot of our behaviors. And I would argue even um, going off the gold standard helped um, kind of... Uh, push along the welfare state and no fault divorce. So I know that's a little bit, but um, if you have anything to add there, feel free. Um, I absolutely think that economics is all about human action. Uh, ultimately, economics is just, it's not about charts. It's not about graphs. It's not about a bunch of complicated mathematical formulas, or at least I don't think it is. I think economics is all about human action, all about individuals making decisions in their individual lives. And to a lesser extent, groups making decisions in their individual lives as individuals. Uh, economics is not sociology, um, but it is about, you know, people in their social lives and the decisions that they make. Uh, anytime you buy something at the store, that's an economic decision. When you buy a car, that's an economic decision. Anything that you buy, being a consumer, or a producer, for that matter, is all about economics. And what a lot of people, and I don't think the vast majority of Americans understand, is that economics is your life. Everything's about economics. And I get pushback from that when I say that every issue is an economic issue, but it's true. Basically, everything, whether it be about culture, whether it be about politics, whatever it be about, uh, whatever it's about, it could be traced back to economics. There is an economic angle to every issue. Yeah, yeah, there absolutely is. And like I said, it definitely is kind of a dry, boring thing, but um, it, it really does kind of well, change one, and manipulate our behavior. Sorry, go ahead. Sure. One, go ahead. Uh, well, let me just make a quick point there. Yeah. Um, yes, it can be dry. And yes, it can be bored. But did you ever think that maybe the reason that it's dry and it's boring to the average person is because it's supposed to be? Did you ever think that that's intentional, that maybe they don't want you to understand economics? So they make it all about charts and graphs and uh, complicated mathematical formulas. So you'll say, well, that stuff's that stuff's like calculus. I don't want anything to do with that stuff when in reality – the decisions that are made economically by the government are impacting you more than anything else in your everyday life. It is very convenient for you to not care about economics, and it is very convenient for you to think that it's too complicated. I'm just throwing that out there. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a very, very uh, good kind of takeaway there. Um, so you're a, a fair bit younger than me, and I, I'm friends with a few people kind of in the Liberty space. I know you're friends with David Brady, and I don't know if you're friends with – um, oh, what the hell is his name? Lorenzo, Sylvia. Um, but they're both younger guys. What kind of is the Zoomer generation about? Because – you hear people saying they're more conservative, but um, I just don't have a good feel for it because, I mean, I, I work with a bunch of boomer cons, right? Dude, I'm a, I'm a fucking mechanic. <laughs> I work on cars, eight, you know, eight to 10 hours a day and, you know, come here and I get to talk to people all, all over the place. But um, when it comes to like the younger people, I just don't have access and I don't <clears throat> know that many like people that are kind of like still in high school or just out of high school. Yeah, well, what I can tell you about the Zoomer generation is either they're going to be very politically moderate or they're going to be straight up communists. Um, <laughs> that's a, that might seem that's like kind rough. of a, yeah, that's kind of a rough outlook, right? Um, well, to be honest, I don't know because we're still figuring stuff out, right? I mean, the Zoomer generation, 18, 21 years old. I mean, we're barely out in the world at this point, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Zoomers still have a lot of stuff to figure out. Uh, right now, I think they're definitely more politically liberal. I don't even like the term liberal. Uh, I don't even like to use the term liberal in reference to left wing, but I mean, it's just a foursome habit, I guess. Um, I don't, I think that they're more politically left leaning, uh, but when they get out into the world and, you know, they start seeing, uh, you know, they start paying taxes, number one, <laughs> um, you know, they start, they start getting that life experience. I think you're going to see kind of a, you know, a reversion, maybe not too much, but at least more of a moderate, uh, more of a moderacy to their approach. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Uh, it, it, it almost seems to me like after, you know, the progressives really had a stronghold, well, they still kind of do, but, um, they had a stronghold on culture, especially through the Obama years, but Trump really represented something cultural that um, I don't think Republicans really had. I mean, even Bush really didn't have that same kind of cultural force behind him like Trump did. He did not. But um, I, I don't know if that's going to continue. I don't know what that looks like for a lot of people. But one of the things that, um, as we've kind of alluded to throughout the show, is, is that people should have listened and watched Trump's approach. Now, you don't have to admire everything about him, and I'm, you, you won't find anybody who criticizes him more than me. But um, th there's things to learn from people that you don't like, obviously. Yes. And one thing that libertarians should learn from Donald Trump, whether you agree with his policies or you abhor his policies or whatever the case may be, he was a fantastic he was a fantastic salesperson. Yeah. He was a fantastic salesperson. I don't care about the product. He was a fantastic salesman. Yeah. And libertarians are terrible salesmen. Ron Paul was a fantastic, or is a fantastic salesman, remains mm -hmm. a fantastic salesman. Is there anyone else you can name in the libertarian movement? I mean, not, you know, <laughs> not to crap on anyone, but like mm -hmm. we don't have those fantastic salesmen like Ron Paul. I mean, there's just there's just no one I can think. Of. Maybe Dave Smith. I can think of some people. I can think of a few people that are good at selling the product, but we don't have enough. We don't have enough yeah. people uh, with that uh, Trumpian salesmanship. I mean, he's a businessman, right? So he was in business his whole life. He was all about, you know, he was a salesman his whole life, and yeah. some people would argue a con man his whole life. But I mean, as far as uh, the salesmanship is concerned, he had it down pat. I mean, here's a guy who's a billionaire, right? A straight up billionaire, an elitist, and he gets um, the middle class, blue collar people. Like he's second only to Jesus here in rural East Tennessee yeah. and in rural Mississippi and rural Georgia and those blue collar areas in Appalachia and, and in the Rust Belt. Like, I mean, how can a guy that is a billionaire that is an elitist that comes from a very elite background, you know, how can he get that kind of a reaction, that love and support from people that are so different from him? And the answer to that question is he's a great salesman and he knows how to sell a product. Right. Absolutely. And that definitely should be noted. So I'm um, kind of hanging around in that realm. What do you think about the Republican Party and the Libertarian Party? Because this is um, – I've hosted – I want to say close to probably five hours of debates on this. And then plus, I mean, that's just like 
strictly strategy shows but then like if you look through the rest of my episodes you're probably going to find tons of other episodes where i talk to people just one-on-one about this but um just hours and hours of content about um this topic in particular i never find myself quite settled but um how do you see it right now how do i see it right now can i give a can i give you a little analogy Sure. So here's the choice that is faced by the American voter, right? Um, with the Democratic Party, the, the Democratic Party's presentation and their policy position and their platform, here's, here's the analogy that I would give. With the Democrats, it's like being put into a frying pan, fried very quickly, and you're done in no time, right? Put into a frying pan. With the Republicans, it's like being slow roasted over a fire, you know, like just slow cook. It's going to take a long time to cook it. And it's it's like roasting a pig over a fire. Right. But with the Democrats, it's like being put into a frying pan, fried up very quickly. So there's your choice that is faced by the average American vote. And uh, it's not a good choice. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK. No, the uh, Libertarian Party. What's your thoughts on the Libertarian Party then? The Libertarian Party has improved uh, since the uh, Mises Caucus took control. Um, there's certainly been some improvement there. I mean, I don't think the last regime, the Libertarian Party, even wanted or even made any attempt to be taken seriously. Uh, but now with the Libertarian Party, you have people like uh, like Dave Benner, you have people like Reed Cooley, you have people like Angela McArdle, serious people, serious people that really care about liberty and uh, reviving, uh, relighting that spark, the Ron Paul 2012, the Ron Paul Revolution. Uh, I really think that is absolutely positive. Um, I don't do I think that the Libertarians will the Libertarian Party will elect a candidate uh, in a state as in a congressional candidate a gubernatorial candidate or a senatorial candidate within the next 20 years? Absolutely not. Do I think that the Libertarian Party could become a viable option if they stick to, you know, local politics, county politics, you know, those uh, lower offices or even state legislative races, if they really push resources toward certain state legislative seats, maybe uh, run unopposed or run against a Democrat when there's no Republican in the race? Absolutely Libertarian Party is a net positive, um, but they are not going to win, uh, per se, on a national or state level. But if the Libertarian Party can refocus onto the local or the state legislative level or even state Senate, maybe, uh, yeah, I think they're absolutely a viable option. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I don't feel too dissimilar. Um it's just sometimes frustrating kind of seeing it at a local level when sometimes things don't necessarily go as you would hope, you know. So um, what were your thoughts on the Speaker of the House situation? This was a very, very interesting thing for me. I'll let you take it away first. Okay. I absolutely abhor national politics because Reasonably in so. my humble opinion, it's a dog and pony show. It's literally a dog and pony show. Mm -hmm. You have two sides that – Go out and have a beer on the weekend. But in front of the cameras, in front of the American people, it's all a fight, right? These people are buddies. 99.9% .9 the Republican and Democratic parties, the, the elected representatives, they can talk a good game. They can throw out the red meat to the base on both sides of the aisle. But these people are buddies, and these people have a great working relationship with each other. And at the end of the day, they are absolutely 100% committed to screwing you over. That's their commitment. Mm -hmm. Where, no matter how much they fight on television, no matter how much they fight on social media or wherever, no matter where the battleground is and how many dirty words are thrown around and how much Republicans call Democrats socialists and Democrats call Republicans Nazis, mm -hmm. they are ultimately on the same team. They are two sides of the same coin. Kevin McCarthy is a spineless jellyfish. He is not going to even make any attempt to advance liberty in any form. The only reason that he is even considering uh, any positive legislation for liberty is because you have a small, very small minority 
of representatives of elected legislators that actually do give a crap. Mm-hmm. And they are uh, with with a um, uh, with a, a margin such as we saw in the last election, with Republicans taking control by I don't want to say how many seats because I'm not sure, but it's a very small majority. Mm-hmm. Those people that might be seen more on the fringe of things, when you have a margin like that, their voices matter. Mm -hmm. And you have to make concessions. And that's the only reason that you're going to see, you're pretty soon you're going to see a bill brought up, which is theater, by the way, it would be great, but it's theater. You're going to see a bill brought up to abolish the IRS and eliminate the federal income tax and replace it with a consumption tax. Those are policies that libertarians support. And you would think, oh, well, the Republicans are going to actually bring this up for a vote. Like, what a great day. No, the Senate is not going to take it up. Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer are not going to touch it. This is theater, okay? And the only reason that this legislation could ever see the light of day is because you have a margin where the voices that care about these issues matter and the establishment does not necessarily have as much control as they would if there were a larger margin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, one of the things that I found very interesting was seeing Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is liked by a lot of libertarians, and I praise her a lot. Um, the one congresswoman who was probably the best congresswoman on Ukraine, um, officially dying on the hill of electing Kevin McCarthy, who pretty much said, eh, we're, we're, we may not send a blank check to Ukraine, but he's agreed for all 100, what is it, $117 billion to Ukraine. At this point, who knows? Like, yeah, who's yeah. Counting, right? it's, it's a literal blank check. So um, seeing her die on that hill, I think is very telling because I think it, it now makes her a lot of her criticisms, rightful criticisms of the Biden administration and their um you know, whole war spending, I think it makes a lot of it null. And it really kind of shows her as a fraud, which I don't say that lightly, but it it doesn't look good. And um, I'm not a big fan of Matt Gates. I think he looks like butthead. And I think he's kind of ridiculous. Sometimes he's Zionist and a China hawk. But um, to see him take uh, Trump's balls out of his mouth for more than a minute um, <laughs> was very admirable. I must say to, to see him, um, protest against trump's wish for mccarthy um i i do admire that and same with the other guys who um who felt the same way i think uh thomas massey even though he never was a big trump guy um i mean he's always good on everything so it's not like you have to worry about that but um yeah those are some of my thoughts i don't know if you have anything else to add there yeah uh matt gets uh maybe a little nutty <laughs> um but he does have some uh, quasi-libertarian leanings yeah. Um, I don't know if you, you could say that he's one of the good guys. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, on Capitol Hill, the, the the list of good guys is very short, and Thomas Massey would be right at the top of the list. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did vote for Kevin McCarthy, but I think I understand why, mm-hmm. because the concessions that he was, you know, he was behind the scenes working out a lot of concessions for McCarthy, and basically it doesn't matter whether Kevin McCarthy is speaker or not. It doesn't matter who is speaker because you're never going to see like any any real change. And I think Thomas Massey recognizes that. All right. But the concession that he was able to get, and I think the reason that he voted for Kevin McCarthy is the formation of a new church committee with Thomas Massey serving on that committee. And if you don't know what a church committee is, basically it's a committee to investigate three letter agencies. Mm. And uh, it's it's basically it's it's a committee that is committed to the purpose of investigating the bureaucracy, particularly three-letter agencies such as the FBI, the CIA, the DEA, the ATF, basically reeling them in. And that is the reason I believe that Thomas Massey voted for Kevin McCarthy, because the establishment of that committee is very much a positive. Yeah, you know what? I would completely agree. I actually didn't know that. So, um, yeah, good on Thomas Massey. But, I mean, you could always depend on him to be good on pretty much everything that you can imagine. He's yes. Solid. Yes. Um, another thing that he's always solid on, which I kind of want to ask your thoughts on and um, kind of how where you put it in your issue hierarchy is the uh, foreign policy front. So um, very high. Th- OK, good, good, good. The one thing that really holds me from supporting Republicans with um, 
a full-throated endorsement of a lot of them is their hawkishness on China. And a lot of them aren't even good on Ukraine like you think they would be. Um, and a majority of the time when they are good on Ukraine, it's because, well, we have to focus on China. And of course, I, I tweeted this out the other day. I said, if you ever want to be disappointed in a Republican, go to their Twitter page and Google or uh, look up Israel or China and you'll be disappointed instantly. Yep. So um, where do you place foreign policy on your issue hierarchy? And, um, you know, what, what, how, how much do you look into that? I guess, like, what's your personal investment in uh, foreign policy? I place foreign policy very high on my issue list. Um, I don't support any politician that votes for any kind of funding, uh, whether it be uh, foreign aid, whether it be military aid, whatever it may be to any country. I will not support you if you uh, believe that it is okay to spend taxpayer dollars uh, and commit taxpayer dollars to the effort of supporting wars halfway around the globe. I will not support you. I will not vote for you. I will make it my mission to see to it that you are primaried and hopefully kicked out. Um, just want to, you know, make that clear. Uh, my position on foreign policy is very much non-interventionist. I do not believe, I believe that Europeans should fund and fight European wars. I believe that uh, I believe that Muslims and I believe that Arabs should fund and fight Arab wars. I believe that Asians should fund and fight Asian wars. And, you know, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. The American people should not be funding any conflict overseas that is not in the direct interest of our national security. And, and Full, I, stop. Yeah, Full stop. I, I, I couldn't agree anymore. Um that, that's that's the you know I, I place foreign policy probably is one of the highest things because a lot of these ter um, terrible policies all over the world do come back home and um, I do think that we're entering a new era specifically with this military buildup around um, China and then obviously with the ongoing situation in Ukraine with Russia um, the reason why I don't personally focus on Ukraine and Russia as much is just because everybody else kind of has that covered and obviously I know you know the the usual spats about the issue but um mm. uh I, I just like i said i don't focus on that as much just because they're all the other libertarians are solid on it like you'd expect them to be but um it, it is funny seeing um people put ukraine flags in their bio and, and there's like this weird dichotomy of um uh, we have to fight to the last ukrainian and putin's a madman but the madman won't use nuclear weapons so we shouldn't we should keep funding ukraine it's like this weird contradiction that um a lot of progressives hold um i don't know if you have anything to add there but yeah it's just very odd to me yeah yeah well ukraine is the current thing right so i mean a lot of people have to virtue signal all about the current thing back in the hashtag me too era everybody was putting hashtag me too in their bio yeah and uh you know everybody talks about ukraine and puts ukrainian flags in their bio it's really virtue signaling um <laughs> of the highest order uh i don't think anyone with a ukraine flag in their bio i would say 99.9 .9 percent of them could not have pointed to ukraine on a map uh a year ago so yeah they it's just virtue signaling it's just you know going with the current thing and having to have an opinion on every issue that's in the news mm -hmm. and of course your opinion has to you know if your opinion doesn't align then you are one thing or another, whether you're a Putin, you know, whether you're a Putin supporter or you support Russia or you're unpatriotic or yeah. the, the same the same nonsense that we heard during the Iraq war, uh, where you were you were a Saddam lover if you didn't think we should get involved in Iraq, mm -hmm. or you were a Taliban lover if you didn't think we should get involved in Afghanistan. It's the same crap, different day. Yeah, it really is. And it's usually <laughs> The, the usual pretext is always a human rights crisis, which is why um, yes, I, I think a lot of libertarians should be really careful with this weird Babies and incubators, yeah. weapons of mass destruction, yep. chemical warfare, you name it, they've used it. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the next thing is the Uyghur genocide. And I had somebody tell me once that, uh, oh, then why is nobody taught? Why is no mainstream politician talking about it? I'm like, the fucking president of the United States condemn china for a uh you know the weird genocide and you're telling me it's not mainstream like it, they're they're throwing out all this stuff here look 
human rights are being violated over in China. We got to do something, right? We got to go save the Uyghurs. But, you know, never mind the fact that our foreign policy has been responsible for the death of millions of uh, Muslims in the Middle East. Yep. And Yemen and in Iraq mm-hmm. and in Afghanistan and you named the Arab country. We've killed people in. Yeah. Um, and Africa, too. Africa yeah. and South America. So yeah. there you go. Um, yeah. I mean, we basically been involved all over the globe, right? Uh, in proxy wars and undeclared wars and, you know, conflicts and quote unquote uh, uh, wars, uh, the war on terror or wars against aggression or whatever, you know, uh, flowery uh, title that people in uh, uh, people in the foreign policy space, the government might give it uh, this war against naked aggression or whatever excuses they use for Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan or whatever nonsense we're involved in right now overseas mm-hmm. so yeah absolutely uh yeah, so, oh. we do need to be careful but uh the uger that uh, uger genocide uger genocide whatever um yeah i'm not very well familiar with that topic i've heard multiple different narratives on that topic it is the favorite issue of conservatives next to fentanyl and how touching it or even looking at it <laughs> is gonna make you drop dead spontaneously mm-hmm. um but uh i'm not sure how much truth there is to it yeah, um, uh, I know I, that Scott Horton has talked about how a lot of the stuff has been exaggerated, and I don't mm-hmm. doubt that the CCP is absolutely is all about human rights abuses and, uh, you know, their gulags or whatever they have over there. Uh, but I'm not entirely certain that the the uh, I guess the uh, the narrative on the Uyghur genocide is entirely correct. And I think I know Scott Horton and people at antiwar.com have talked about how it was based on flawed reporting. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, on that issue, I guess I would have to say I don't know. Uh, Is it as bad as some people might let on? I don't know. Um, So I'm not going to comment on that specifically because I just don't know. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, if you are curious about this, this has been something that I've really been passionate about because, like you said, a lot of people on the right um, look a lot into it. Um, my buddy Pat McFarland from the Libertarian Institute had done a whole documentary on it. So if you're ever curious, uh, look up Vital Descent. I will check that yeah, out. Yeah, Vital Descent, Stand of the Century. He's the guy. He's been on Scott's show twice, and um, he broke down this whole thing. So um, like I said, if you're ever curious about that kind of stuff, he's like the China guy, if you will. So uh, th- that's a little bit of a side tangent. Um, But – um. I am stoked to tell you guys about the show's new sponsor. I am now working with MTS Nutrition, which is a brand that I've believed in for a very long time, and they run awesome cells and they have awesome products. So um, I want to tell you about their amazing protein powder, which you're going to ask me how many pounds I have of the protein powder, and the answer is all of them. So here I got red velvet cake, 25 grams of protein, and they have the amino acids and everything on there, 59 servings. Peanut butter fluff, uh, fluffer nutter, 26 grams of protein, and then also the chocolate chip cookie, which literally has real pieces of chocolate chip cookie in there. So 27 grams of protein, 180. As I've talked about on the show, getting your protein in is very, very important. So make sure you hit that link below and purchase your protein powder through MTS Nutrition. Boom! I don't know how much you kind of look into this stuff or what it's like for you, but... um, Intersexual dynamics is a topic that I like to talk about a lot and kind of how um, I hate to sound woke because when you start saying gender stuff, it sounds woke, but um, kind of how gender roles are playing out for people your age. Like um, to me, it kind of seems like a lot of men are invisible to a lot of women and women get a lot of attention through social media. So um, typically they're looking for the ideal man pretty much at all times. And the men who may not necessarily be that ideal man at a younger age, um, they're just completely invisible. So I don't know if you have any thoughts or if you have kind of any experience or knowledge of kind of what the dating scene's like for people your age. Um, it, it's just it, this kind of stuff fascinates me just because it's really interesting to see how feminism has changed the way that we look at um, relationships over the last 70 years. The dating scene is a mess, man. Um, <laughs> wherever you look, the dating scene is a mess. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have people uh, that, you know, you have young girls, uh, young, beautiful women that spend, uh, you know, every waking moment on Instagram or TikTok. And they think they they want 
uh, dating, they won't date a guy unless they make four hundred thousand dollars a year and they're six feet tall and they have like their the, their, the three their criteria. Yeah, yeah, their criteria uh, for dating someone is just off the wall, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think that there's been a lot of uh, false expectations uh, in the past 10, 15 years that have been coming, you know, both from women and from men. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that topic that topic is interesting. Uh, it's interesting to see how the dating scene has changed from, you know, the 90s as opposed to now, where we have social media and a lot of false expectations and, uh, you know, assumptions that are made. But mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I don't really, uh, I, I can't, I can't really comment on that specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, because I mean, I'm just not, you know, well versed on that topic. But I would right. say that it has changed tremendously from the 90s and the 80s. And, you know, things have changed. You've had, you've had, you know, well, you had the Me Too movement, number one. Uh, yeah. You had feminism definitely took more of a center stage. Um, so, yeah, it is, it has absolutely changed things. And I don't think it's changed things for the better. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And uh, ho- hopefully it's not, you know, kind of out of um, your comfort zone or anything like that, just because, like I said, I, it's something that interests me a lot. So um, mm-hmm. we've been shooting the shit for about yeah. 45 minutes now. I got a couple last questions for you and then we'll rock and roll out of here. Um, I got to yes, watch because I got my pit bull right here. Um, if you pay, <laughs> if you pay attention on Twitter, my pit bull's apparently gonna. It, my pit bull's hunting down children. I was told today. I I swear to God. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah, his they, name? Uh, that that's this is my baby girl. This is Lily. Oh okay. Yeah, she, nice. she's she's sweet as the uh, day is long, and I'm sure probably here in a few seconds she's probably gonna try and crawl up on my lap. <laughs> Anyways, um, she's cute. Yeah, thank you. Um, what does liberty look like to you? Liberty looks like, uh, number one, I think there are two, well, three, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. But I think there are some main aspects of what liberty looks like, some main criteria. For that. Um, do you have economic freedom? Essentially, uh, are you paying taxes or are you paying uh, to the government, uh, whether, you know, whether it be taxes, whether it be fees, whatever the case may be, are you being robbed? Number one, if you're being robbed, you don't have a you don't have a state of liberty. Um, if you are not free to engage in you know whatever behavior that uh, you think uh, is fitting uh, based on your own moral compass or your religion or whatever the case may be, then I don't think you're free. Mm-hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that people should be free to go out and murder people because their own moral compass tells them that's okay. Because you know when libertarians talk. You know, people uh, on the left and right have to take it to the extreme, right? Right. You have to take you have to take everything to the extreme. You have to say, oh, well, you know, should should you be able to walk down the street and shoot heroin and create a uh, create a toxic environment uh, to to everyone else? No. Well, I mean, that's that that's that's the extremes. Right. And usually when we talk about ideology, we don't talk about the extremes because uh, I don't know anyone who's going to go walk down the street shooting heroin. Right. Um, I think that's uh, that's that's kind of a straw man. That's kind of an argument that just comes from a point of having to take something to the maximum extreme that you can to try to mm-hmm. discredit it. Like, uh, like you might take capitalism to the extreme. You might say, oh, well, uh, should you be able, if, 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 if capitalism is a completely free market, shouldn't you be able to trade each other? Shouldn't the slave trade be in existence? And then no, that gets into all kinds of other arguments. But I mean, I think to summarize that, I think a state of liberty is number one, economic freedom. Number two, personal freedom. Are you free to engage in uh, habits? Are you, are you free to do what you want to do within reason? And are you free to engage in the market and to be free economically, uh, to, to trade with other people, uh, to even barter, even barter with other people, mm-hmm. uh, to make transactions within the free market? If you are free to do that, then I consider that liberty. If there's no impediment to that, then that is liberty. And are you free personally? So are you free economically? And are you free personally? And then there is one, is there, there's a third criteria. To me, liberty is a condition without an oligarchical, uh, well, let, let, me, let, let me put it this way, without a monopoly on power and control. Mm-hmm. So is there a, ask yourself this question, is there a small group of, say, 
535 individuals that have an absolute monopoly on authority and control and that you are to look to as not your guides, not your leaders, you know, not your stewards, Mm -hmm. not your referee, but as your ruler. Does that exist in your society? If that does exist, you are not free and you are not in a state of need. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, that was a very, very elaborate answer. And that's um, definitely one of the more interesting ones I've gotten when I've asked that. Um, So uh, one more question or two more questions. What does health look like to you? Health as in uh, as in bodily health. I think wherever you want to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that I, you know, we can touch on because I know you're all about liberty and you're also all about health. So the normalization of obesity. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this idea that you are beautiful at any size or you are, uh, you know, you're, you're not unhealthy because you're overweight. Mm -hmm. It's not true. If you are obese, you are at a much higher risk of developing heart problems. You're at a much higher risk of developing hypertension, and you're probably going to die an earlier death than someone who's not. Mm -hmm. So I think a healthy society, um, in addition to being a society with liberty, you need a healthy society. You need a society of people that are not killing themselves, right. uh, whether it be, you know, by engaging in certain behaviors. I mean, you could make the argument that doing hard drugs, like shooting up heroin or, you know, doing crack cocaine or meth, if you're killing yourself, then I don't think you have a healthy society if you have people killing themselves. Mm-hmm. Now, I come down on that like, you should be free to do that, but you should not do that. Like, there's a difference... Right between being free to do something and actually doing something. So I think you should have a healthy society and you should have a society of people that care about their health, their physical and mental well-being, and especially men and women in, in communities and in the society should care about their physical and mental health. That means people should, you know, work out when they get the chance. People should, uh, care about their mental health as in if they have some kind of a problem going on in their life, they should go seek help. And they shouldn't be afraid to reach out. Mm -hmm. So I think a healthy society, what a healthy society looks like to me is you don't have an obesity crisis. You don't have a mental health crisis. And most people are, you know, you have a high life expectancy. And, you know, in addition to having a healthy society, and this gets back to the free market and economic Mm -hmm. freedom, you have an abundance of food and you have an abundance of, you know, sustenance for people to satisfy themselves. Mm -hmm. But there are certain directions that's satisfying yourself. There are certain things you can do to satisfy yourself that can kill you. So people should be careful. And we should foster a culture of moderation, whether it be in drinking, whether it be in drugs, whether it be in eating, whatever it be, we should have a moderate culture where moderation is encouraged. That's what I think a healthy society is. Awesome. Yeah, that was a really, really great elaborate answer as well. Um, Where can everybody find you, Ezra? This has been an awesome conversation, very enlightening as well. Thank you. You can follow me at Ezra for Liberty on Twitter. Um, I'm not on any other social media yet. I'll probably have to be in the future. Um, but at Ezra for Liberty on Twitter, I'm pretty active on there. And yeah, shoot me a follow. I'll follow you back. Thanks, man. Well, um, I appreciate you coming on and hanging out. Um, no problem. Yeah. If Thanks I, for having you, me on. Of course. Of course. Um, if y'all got anything else, we'll close her out and I'll see you on the other side, man. All right, man. You have a good one. Thank you. You too.